In our next section, 2.2, we're going to be looking at quantitative data and how to display it or organize it so that we can draw inferences and conclusions. We're going to organize the data, discrete data in tables, construct histograms, organize continuous data in tables, construct histograms of continuous data, draw dot plots, and identify the shape of a distribution. First, we have to figure out whether we have discrete or continuous data. If the data is discrete and there are relatively few um, different values of the variable, the categories of data, which we call classes, will be the observations, as we just saw in the last section. Okay. If the data is discrete, but there are many different values of the variables, or if the data is continuous, the categories of data, the classes again, must be created using intervals of numbers. So let's look at an example. The manager of a Wendy's fast food restaurant wants to know the typical number of customers who arrive during the lunch hour. The data in Table 8 represents the number of customers who arrive at Wendy's for 40 randomly selected 15 inter minute intervals of time during lunch. For example, during one 15-minute interval, seven customers arrive. Construct a frequency and relative frequency distribution of the data. Okay. So first of all, we have discrete data. Why is it discrete? Because people are integers values, right? You can't have a half a person. You can't have a third. And so the values, the numerical values are discrete, one, two, not the values in between them, one and two, which would make it continuous. Okay. Second, we don't have a lot of different um, answers. So we have a discrete with relatively few answers. Um, you know, you can see here we go from one, and I think the highest number is 11. So that's only 11 different choices potentially. So this we're going to um, display in a similar way as we did with the qualitative data in the last section, which is just a table of the number of customers, each of the answers here the frequency that those answers happen, um, and then the relative frequency, which of course is um, the frequency divided by the total number of responses. Okay, so again, uh, discrete because it doesn't represent the values between integers, and then there's a relatively few number of choices, which we can see here is just 11 different choices. So we do this exactly like we do with qualitative data in that we organize it um, using the actual responses, um, the, the actual responses in the raw data. A histogram is a, a new kind of bar gram, if you will, and it's constructed by drawing rectangles for each class of data. The height of the rectangle is the frequency or relative frequency of the class, which is what we saw exactly with uh, a bar graph. And, but the, and the width of each rectangle is the same, and the rectangles touch each other. And this is really the difference between a histogram and a bar graph. The rectangles touch each other with the histogram. Construct a frequency histogram and a relative frequency histogram of the number of customers arriving at Wendy's. And here we can see the data that was just in the last table in the last two examples. Um, but in terms of the number of customers, and again, here they're just bar graphs, um, they're vertical bar graphs, um, but the key thing here is that they touch each other. You know, that's probably an interesting Google question. Um, why is a histogram such a different vehicle than a um, bar graph? And why is it, you know, what is the implications of the, the, the rectangles touching each other versus not? Again, rectangles and histograms touch, but the rectangles and bar graphs do not. Again, classes are categories into which data are grouped. When a data set consists of a large number of different discrete data values, or when a data set consists of continuous data, we must create classes by using intervals of numbers. Here we have a table that's showing the number of mothers in the United States ages 15 through 54 who had their fourth child in 2016. This table is a typical frequency distribution created from continuous data. Okay, so we have all the ages between 15 and 19, um, 20 and, and 24, etc. So we, 
the whole range is a continuous data. So if you're 15 and a half, you'd fall in here, etc. It's a little bit sketchy, but <coughs> excuse me. Um, but it is continuous in that we're covering all different age range from zero, well, from 15 through 54. Okay. When you're talking about, um, we talk about limits, and the lower case, the lower case limit of a class is the smallest value within the class. So we're talking about just the first class. The lower class limit is 15. The upper class limit is the largest value, so that's 19. And the class width is determined by the difference between consecutive lower class limits. So here we would take 20 minus 15 to find the class width, which is 5. 20 minus 15 is 5, okay? Organize continuous data in open-ended tables. One exception to the requirement of equal class widths occurs in what in open-ended tables. A table is open-ended if the lower, if the first class, the lowest class, has no lower class limit, or the last class has no upper class limit. Here we have a table um, of the residents of the United States who earned a bachelor's degree as of 2017 um, and we go from 25 to 44 so it does the lower the first class has a lower class limit which is 25 but notice the last class um, has no upper limit it's just 65 and over and so this is why this table is an open-ended table let's look at example three organizing continuous data into frequency and relative frequency distribution. Here we have um, parking and camera violation fines. This is just a list um, of the total fine, including late penalties and dollars for a random sample of 50 parking and camera violations in the city of New York. To construct a frequency distribution, we first have to create classes of equal length. So we have to look at all these numbers and then figure out, um, you know, um, the range, if you will. This is where like a, a program like Excel can be really helpful because we could sort these from smallest to largest. So table 12 has 50 observations that range from 65 to 322. Um, dollars and 61 cents. So we decide to create the classes such that the lower class limit of the first class is 50 and then the class width is 25. So we'd go uh, 50 to 74, 75 to 99, etc. All right. So we need to build that table and because this is continuous, um, notice we don't go 50 to 74 as I just said, I misspoke. These are dollars. So we would go 50 to 74.99 and then 75 to 99.99. These classes need to not be overlapping in any way. Um, and they also need to make sure that they are um, fully comprehensive, that they cover everything. And so the mistake I just made uh, speaking on the last slide was that we would go from 50 to 74 and 75 to 99. But of course, if we do that, then we're going to miss anything that's $74.01 all the way up to $74.99. Those are really typical mistakes to make when doing surveying and statistics that we kind of overlook until we've collected the data and then we realize something doesn't fit in. Um, and so we have to go back and fix it. All right. Um, so we tally the data. Of course, we count each um, occurrence that occurs within each range. Um, we tally that and then build the table. Um, this second column shows the frequency of each class, um, and we can see um, from the frequency that a fine between $200 and $224.99 occurs with the most frequency. We calculate all the relative frequencies, and we can see that that um, dollar amount it represents 26% of the fines um, in this sample. Okay, so again, like here we've had to do a little more work. The actual answers 
um, in a continuous data um, table is a range of values, not the specific answers that people or the, the raw data that we're collecting. Um, when we have a lot of answers, um, we create intervals, if you will, so that we can slot them into those intervals. Sometimes these intervals, um, you know, we have to, you have to be very thoughtful about them in your study so that they make sense. Um, sometimes, you know, uh, you know, if you make too big of an interval, uh, then you lose some of the insight from um, your study. Um, now, the nice part is, is that your intervals are um, when you're massaging the data as opposed to collecting raw data. So sometimes you may make an interval and then you realize it's not really telling you what you want. You have the raw data, so you can go back and change the intervals and create a new table, if you will. So how should we determine the lower class limit of the first class and class width? The first thing you wanna do is choose the lower class limit of the first class. So what you wanna do is find the smallest observation or a convenient number slightly lower than the smallest observation in the data set. Um, in the first set, we were talking about dollars and cents. And so the lowest, um, the lowest, the smallest observation was a decimal with, um, I don't even remember it exactly. So we just went to a, a lower number and started with something uh, that was also convenient, <clears throat> um, such as $50, an, an even number to work with that we could also end on a 50 or a 25, et cetera. <clears throat> then determine um, the class width. Decide on the number of classes. Generally, you're gonna choose between five and 20 classes. The smaller the data set, the fewer classes you should have. Um, but once you get beyond 20 classes, it's hard to kind of relate the data and make good observations. <clears throat> then you're gonna compute the class width and round up to a convenient um, value. So here what you're doing is simply taking the largest data value minus uh, subtracting the smallest data value and dividing by the number of classes. Then you'll round up uh, and then you'll round upwards um, so that you cover all the classes and to some convenient number. Again, we used multiples of 25 in the last example. Um, and so when we calculated 322.61 minus 65 divided by 11 classes, we got $23.419, um, which we um, then lowered or, or then raised, excuse me, to 25 and that was going to be the width. So we started at 50, then went to 75, etc. I'm not saying those exactly right, but you know what I'm talking about. And notice that rounding up may result in fewer classes um, than you were originally intended, but it, should, it shouldn't take a lot of the classes out, just maybe one or two. So now we're just going to put the data that we came for from the last example into a histogram. And so what we're doing here is we're gonna use the same data from the table that we just built, the frequency and, um, and just indicating um, with the bar graph, but a histogram with the bars with the rectangles touching. Um, notice that um, we have a couple places between 75 and 100 and 275 and 300 where there weren't any um, tickets are issued, so those have no rectangles, okay? So there is a gap between the first and third rectangle, but we need to have a zero value in there so there's no rectangles, okay? Here we have the exact same um, histograms and example, um, but we're using technology, which we would normally do. Um, specifically, these diagrams are built using StatCrunch, um, I use Excel um, usually, um, mainly because that's what I used in business. Um, and while I did do statistical analysis, it wasn't the, the major part of my job. Um, but I, you know, it, it was a frequent um, part of any project that I was involved in. So this is really the same thing. You know, the key things here are figuring out the axes, the classes, the width of the classes, etc. And again, you see 
Um, the absence of um, bars when there aren't any um, responses in those categories or when that frequency is zero, thus the relative frequency is zero as well. Dot plots are pretty simple. They're not widely used, but they're another visual representation of data. And it's something easy to build when you don't have um, uh, technology to use. And it's also a way to sketch out the data um, so you can see what's happening. It's kind of like a, a paper version of a bar graph, um, especially if you don't have a lot of data to input, then you can kind of get a quick uh, view of what your bar graph or histogram will look like. Simply put, a dot plot is drawn by placing each observation horizontally in increasing order and then placing a dot above the observation each time it's observed. This may not make sense, but let's look at an example. Draw a dot plot for the number of arrivals at, at Wendy's um, from the data, um, at Wendy's data from table eight that we used earlier, and there's the table um, right there. So what you're gonna be doing is you're gonna put the number of customers um, horizontally, one through 11, um, the smallest observation number is one, the greatest was 11. You're gonna put those on a horizontal line and then for each occurrence, you're gonna place a dot. So next, above one, you're gonna have one dot. Above two, you're gonna have six dots, etc. And so here's the table. And so what this does, again, it kind of gives you a, a simple representation of the bar graph and a really quick um, kind of a summary of the data visually so you can start making inferences and it might actually help you figure out other versions of graphs or tables um, that you'd like to use. One way that a variable is described is through the shape of its distribution. Distribution shapes are typically classified as symmetric, skewed left, or skewed right. A uniform distribution is where you kind of have a horizontal line where the frequency of each value of the variable is evenly spread out across the values of the variable. Now, this example is a little bit extreme because it gives the exact same variable. And really what you're talking about is a relative horizontal line. It doesn't have to be the exact. A bell-shaped distribution, you've heard of this, a bell-shaped curve. These are one of the most common um, that we're familiar with. And this is where the highest frequency occurs in the middle and the frequency tails off to the left and to the right. A skewed right distribution has a tail to the right. So the tail to the right is longer um, than the, the tail to the left. And by the same kind of idea, a skewed left um, has a tail to the left um, to the smaller values um, is longer than the tail to the right, okay? So these are some common distributions. It's important to realize that, um, first of all, we don't describe qualitative data um, as skewed left, skewed right, or uniform. It's also important to recognize that data, you know, doesn't naturally, or, or it won't always be in a, in a, um, a common shape that we can uh, identify, okay? And so you don't wanna fit data into a shape and you don't want to look for that or to create a survey or or tool that's going to create a specific shape if it happens it happens if it doesn't it doesn't and then finally not everyone agrees on the same shape they may see different things just as when you're looking in clouds you may see different shapes in the data it, it just kind of you know it it gives you some more conclusions or inferences if like the data is skewed um, left um, this is typically toward um, lower values, okay? That, that there's uh, much more of a higher population on the, on the higher values. Um, where skewed right distribution means that um, there's higher in the lower values. So it, it creates some sense of inferences. You know what, look at the table, look at the data and, and interpret it. Don't, you know, this part of it, eh, it can be kind of helpful. Um, and may, again, help you with some conclusions, but it's not um, all-encompassing. It's just another way to look at data. And again, remembering that we are highly visual creatures, most of us, um, visual stimuli. 
um, is very powerful, and so it can tell a powerful story. Our last example here is to um, use the histogram in the last example for the fines paid for parking and camera violations in New York City and to describe the shape. What do you see there? Is it right skewed, left skewed, uniform, symmetric, bell? Well, it looks a little bell-like and to some degree there's not a wide variance although this guy sticks out but the values are pretty low. You know, it, it looks somewhat symmetric, it looks a bit like a bell, but honestly I wouldn't use either to describe this. Um, I don't think it fits into any of the models. Not in a way um, that helps us make better um, conclusions or inferences or helps to help other people understand those. So I wouldn't use any of the common shapes.